you who are your real friends and your allies. Now you get to see. You get to know your friends in two situations, in travel and in hardship. Yeah. And that's when you get to know who are your real family, who are your real friends. And I've kept score on every media outlet, every, every person that bashed Dubai, by the way. So when they come and they flip with the, with the wind, but I know your names. On the number, it says Judas. Okay, <laughs> Judas. Is there any media here? Uh, I don't care. No, no, I know. It's not an issue at all. Yeah. Now, uh, what we're trying to understand, uh, Ahmed, and I think uh, I'm fascinated by your story, and one of the things is the human side of you. Uh, a lot of people here are entrepreneurs, the SME organizations. They sit, they'll go back tonight and they'll be thinking, my God, what do we have to do to become bigger and how do we visualize something much, much bigger than that? You said you started with something which Bigger than? Anything. Bigger than anything that, that people would normally expect, normally. I have a feeling that they want to make sure that they cover their costs and make a good profit and keep that consistent. If that's all it is, then that's good. But I I'm assuming. I mean, no, is there anyone trying to be the next George Soros and uh, Buffett? Uh, how many oh, people hands. want to be? How many people here who are not millionaires? So we won't go to the who want to be millionaires. No, but you said bigger than you know everything. Yeah. I doubt that they want to have a consistent profit-making business. It's not always about money. It's about making a difference. That's what I feel. I don't agree with you. I feel that a lot of people are coming into business to make it to make a difference, to have a different angle. It's not about money. I'm not suggesting it's only you money. You just said that I corrected, so All I'm right. just saying. I, I and there's no you. hands. <laughs> there's no hands here. Are there Nobody wants to be Warren Buffett. No, forget Warren Buffett. Does anybody okay. want to be a millionaire here who is not currently? Okay. Only but there's one, two, three, four. Uh, don't be shy because… Uh, is that it? And how, how many of you have signed up for the lottery? Who wants to be a millionaire? <laughs> Actually, it, it obviously means that the others already are millionaires. That's what it is. Now, the, the, the real reason for the question is that you have an amazing power to visualize and to be able to see beyond what, no, what people will see normally. In other words, as I, a phrase that I use, you defy gravity. So it's, it's the people like you who change the world. What I am for the audience to put together, uh, to come, come to you and sort of say, well, what are the, the, what's that secret sauce that sits inside your heart, that's the engine that drives you, that you go and see beyond what is normal? What is, because everything you have been doing, at the speed at which you're doing, and at the scale at which you're doing, it's beyond normal behavior. No consultant can uh, ever guess you. So I'm going to ask you a question later, what are you going to do it when you're 75 years old? But that's coming much, much later. But you said, um, you know, what, uh, what makes me go at that speed? It's men like Muhammad al-Abbar, for example. You look at his story and the challenges he had to face. He IPO'd his company before there was a stock market. Who does that? He does that. He almost brought in uh, the Donald Trump show for Amar. It's a great branding movie, a TV series, and it is to promote employees of what it's about awareness. Really, I think the most influential person in my working environment, really influential, leave the critics. I have to thank the critics for making me what I am, aggressive, bullish, and sometimes a big jerk, but I'll thank them for that. But the person I really learned from at how to handle difficult situations, interviews, and all that, is none other than Mohammed Al-Abbar. I tell you right now, every meeting he sits in, it might be about, you know, bouncing ideas and we come up to a conclusion. Isn't that the assumption? It's never the case with him. He already knows what he wants. He's going after a target. He, know, he preempts exactly what's going to be told to him. And that's every single meeting Hamid Abbar goes to. He will deny it, of course, but I've seen it ha happen. I had a difficult time with the gold bullion coin, I can tell you that. And the only way I, I got them to agree to give us the image of the uh, gold bullion coin, let me show you. Let me show you what what people in Dubai have to go through. It wasn't Abbar, let's say it's the lawyer from Syria whispering in his ear. They wanted the lump sum fee or royalty fee to use that image on a gold bullion coin. So not them, the lawyer. And the lawyer says it's not Abbar, of course, they were supportive, it's the shareholders or the board. And the board did stop his show, which he wanted to do as Donald Trump. 
they voted it out. Akbar has to respect the board of directors, has to respect the shareholders. So it took me like four or five months till I put my foot down and told them, enough is enough, I'm going with this. And I gave Abbar the reason, he said, thank you. He actually thanked me because he knew no one can argue the case. Mind you, the four or five months was because I was making sure his high Sheikh Haiba bin Zayed's image is up to standard. So in parallel, I let them do their thing, the process. But I pulled out the 100 dirham and I said, listen, when the central bank pays the trade center royalty fees for this image of the, what used to be the tourist office tower in, the, in Dubai, the trade center, when they start paying royalty fees, trust me, I'll pay you the royalty fees. And Abbas said, thank you, I'll hold on to this 100 dirham and that's the excuse. These are things that we don't need to go through, but guess what? It happens. It's not what you learn in school. Um, the, I think also it helped me to go to Lausanne, um, the IMD car, course, which I took called Building on Talent. I never wanted to go because to me it's not only foreign, it's scary to leave a, an economic war zone and say, hey, I'm going to take some courses and I'll be back. Yeah, I might be back, but I don't know if the, my, my chair will be back. The, the turnaround in jobs happen really fast in Dubai. So, but I did learn a lot in um, IMD, which used to be Nestle for executives from Nestle, but then they made, a, made it into a spin-off for executives. And executives from Rio Tinto, Ed Salat, Adnok, all of people go there, and they come up with something. And I came up with some, what I came out from, the person that went there and left is two different people. When I went there, I always questioned when people were bothered by the way I handled matters. When I went there, everything they talked about was unorthodox and you know how a good example is uh, that clothing store Zara which basically beats its competition by taking the best practices from industries that has nothing to do with the clothing industry DHL I think FedEx um, other industries that not to do but it is about the speed getting the product to the end users at a, at a, at, at a phenomenal speed you talked about speed the reason I have to keep going fast is the minute His Highness notices I slow down, just like his horses, puts them aside. So seriously, he treats us as his horses. He loves horses. But um, the old horses go somewhere else afterwards. <laughs> so those so slow horses, let me put it that way. So we got to stay fit. Um, I do take supplements. And uh, how do I put this? I tried to balance out the workout. I had a conversation with Sheikh Hamzaid about four years, uh, four days ago, and you know, what, it's a weekend. He doesn't like to talk about work a lot during the weekend. I mean, especially if it's me who's calling, because I'll talk from one commodity till end. Pretty much how I'm bothering you right now. So he said, uh, he said, uh, so how's the gym with you, Ahmed? I said, uh, awful, because I can't be consistent in it. I like consistency, but I was looking forward to this. That's why tonight I'm here, and you have any Q&A in mind, anything. I'm all yours today, and I'm on Twitter. It's at Ahmed bin Sulaim. Don't look at the Instagram, that's for fun. LinkedIn is the serious one, and Twitter also, I respond to every, anybody. Um, and I block anybody as well, so you know, don't get too cocky with your questions or uh, <laughs> accusations. But, the, but really, it's Muhammad al-Abbar, really, because he he always went to work with an urgency. There's a nice uh, interview with Muhammad Al-Abbar, which was like a month or two or three months after the delivery of Burj Khalifa, two page about his next chapter in life. And he said, what did the world expect of me after building Burj Khalifa? Sit down, like I'm sitting down, with, a, with, with, with Chai Karak? No, I need to work. I can't sit at home, that's too depressing. So the next thing is commodities, and he was ahead of the curve. We were also with, with in Africa. He's in Africa. We as DMCC are in Africa. We're, we have close ties with Angola, Namibia, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. Even though Zimbabwe had challenges, sanctions, Abbar at the same time also as a private investor took risks by going there. But his justification is, why should I wait when it's all clear? Stand in line? No, I want to be ahead of it. I want to build the relation. So he likes to be ahead of the curve all the time. And from property developing JLT, he was a big inspiration. He still is. 
to commodities. He's also an inspiration for someone that jumps into an initiative that he didn't have a lot of background in. But if it makes sense, if you understand supply and demand, if you understand incentives, then you pretty much can do a lot of things in this world. And the tools you have in this era are a thousand times more than when I started in 2002. We didn't have Blackberries. In fact, I was afraid of Blackberry. They told me, you get your emails in the phone. I'm like, that's scary. I'm not having Blackberry. I boycotted Blackberry for two years and then for the wrong reason, I got the Blackberry, not for work reason, let's put it that way. And the nice thing is, you get back to your office, you don't touch your PC. It looks sad all alone. I, I use it to watch maybe a big video shot of something, but it's not about exchanging emails. That's done on my uh, Samsung Note 3, the iPhone sometimes, because I'm very fluent with the iPhone, but I'm learning on the Samsung Note 3. I dropped the Blackberry since they've given the BBM uh, messaging to to Note 3 and, uh, and the iPhone. But you have the tools, you have more than enough tools. So it's, uh, it's something amazing that we can do going forward. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter what age you are. And I have a nice story about, about not giving up and keep pushing through. KFC, the man behind KFC was always a failure in sales and whatever he did, but he never gave up. Then he saw this fat food, fast food industry coming up and said, I would dress up as a colonel and start selling fried chicken. Call it Kentucky fried chicken. Nothing to do with K Kentucky. Not, he's not even a colonel. And KFC is up there with McDonald's. And that was at the age of 55. So keep that in mind. Never give up. Uh, you made me lose it. What, uh, <laughs> okay, now you can ask me your questions again. <laughs> okay. Uh, since you're talking about KFC, my, I'll use the, the metaphor. Yes. What is your secret sauce uh, and your secret uh, ingredients that you put in? Because the MCC is one zone, JASA, uh, uh, TCOM, uh, that's just in Dubai. And also, uh, there are so many in the region. What makes you different? And w what is the, the secret of that success? What's the ingredient there? Retaining the right skills, retaining the right people with the right attitude before everything else. You can have someone with all the PhDs, someone that built 20 free zones, but if his heart is not for Dubai, he or she will not deliver. If he or she has the right attitude and, and really have their heart at work, you will see some delivery. And you know what? At the end of the day, it's God's will at the end of the day. You have to understand that this is life. Murphy's Law really kicks in sometimes. And... Uh, you have to have put in everything. You have to you leave no bullets, take no prisoners when you go out there and work. And the benchmark are not TCOM. I do coordinate with Rastamani and the Dubai Holding Group, um, Javza. I do coordinate and, and we bounce ideas sometimes. But we have to be careful as in not taking steal, steal concepts from each other. i give you a nice example. Two years ago or three years ago, three years ago, I went to the IMD Institute. I think IMD conference, no, not IMD conference, Milk and, Milk and Conference. That was in LA. You can consp conspire all you want and say that was a reason for me to go to LA and enjoy <laughs> watching a Lakers game all you want, but I was there and I bumped into colleagues from Adia and colleagues from, well, my friend from Dubai Holding, who's now the director of strategy, Yusuf Al Mullah. And we went there. I wanted to attend all the commodity related businesses. He wanted to attend all the finance business. I said, that puts me to sleep. I need to go, can we at least share? And um, I guess in the end, I think it was 20% commodity, seven, and 80% whatever he wanted. I gave up afterwards. Because the, on the commodity side, but what, what they say publicly is different from what they do. Because you can't blame them. They can't really roll out what they want. They're businesses. And here we're free zones to attract businesses. Like I said, we attract so the confidence in the MCC is unparalleled to any free zone because we attracted both Ambani bro brothers, both Reliance, around, 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 the, around the same time, during the most heated time. Now they're working together, but they were in the MCC because they know beyond the benefit of doubt that papers don't get mixed up and we don't take sides. We do our job and that's it. But the point I'm coming to, we watched a movie called, uh, and it was like my third or fourth time. I used to take a lot of friends and we go watch, uh, last time in Ibn Battuta Mall in the cinema, we watched uh, 
Fast and Furious 4. So we watched Fast and Furious 4. And I told my friend, you know what would be cool? With all these pizzas in Dubai and the autodrome and the Yas Island that's being built, to have a Fast and Furious in Dubai. And if not, have a replica of it. It was just a thought. I didn't care for the credit. He knows that. I care about commodities, gold, and, all, and attracting and breaking records and these things. From that day, I didn't know him and his management were interacting with the people behind Fast and Furious. So by the time they agreed, it was Fast and Furious 7, I believe, in Dubai, 6 or 7? 6 is the one that's out. It's 7, that's the one in Dubai. 6 is the one in Germany. 5 is the one in, uh, I think, was it 4 in Brazil? Five, 6, okay. Whatever it is. And actually, they got them to agree, and it's going to be in Dubai. So whenever that happens, I'll, uh, I'll take a break in case they run me over. Or if they film it somewhere else and, you know, pray. But that's the type of, you know, we look at something and we don't give up. Some concept might take years, but once it comes to fruition, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to be delivered. And I think, I think that Dubai movie will be exciting just as it was exciting to, uh, to host Kobe Bryant in Almas Tower and give him the license number 24 since we registered from 1000 onwards. It was number 24. I had a friend of mine said, Mike Tyson is here, he's doing his show, we'd like to bring him to Almas Tower. I avoided that because I, my ears are small enough. I don't need any, any misunderstanding, but it seems that he's a quiet person, but you know, it's the quiet things that are the most dangerous yeah, with, this, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the pigeon voice. Yes, he's, he's a very interesting man. I, I, I don't understand his show, but that's another discussion. I don't think he understands time. his show. There you go. <laughs> now, um, we'll get to some of your passions and fun, but one of the key ones is cars. You love driving cars. Uh, I think, you, 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 how many cars do you have? I'm a, I'm a Saeed al Tayyar from the Tayyar Motors called the Serial Range Rover buyer. <laughs> but I was disappointed with the latest edition. And I believe so was His Highness. There was a big PR about the first Range Rover was Sheikh Mohammed's, but you're never going to see him drive one anymore because the same disappointment in that car was the same disappointment that made him stop, I think, 15 years ago. But my disappointment was it's as if we went back four years ago and they increased the price. I didn't see the infinite, so I went for the SLS Gullwing. And really, I went for the SLS Gullwing because the, the, no the noose or the leash on my neck from my father and family doesn't exist anymore, so I got what I like. And the SLS is there, and you know, the Autodrome is there, the Ass Island is there, it's just I didn't have the time to really utilize it. The other car, believe it or not, you'll see it on TV soon, is a Mini Cooper. And uh, I did an interview with Dubai TV, the Arabic uh, Dubai TV. I did not know it was more than an interview. It was also some, sh some shots, me walking, and after walking, walking out of Almas. And when walking Almas, she got into my car. And to my luck, it was one of those days where I did not want to take out my SLS out and put that car and then go out, because I am always in a rush, as you can see in the papers, as you can see at work. So it's about convenience. If these cars were parked next to each other, I might have got one day SLS. It should have been the SLS that day, but my luck, the camera's recording me getting into a Mini Cooper and moving out. It's not, I'm, I don't feel any shame about it, I don't care. But, but then we went to the park area and the JLT1 building area. But um, coming about passion, passion for cars, you can ask, uh, as he likes to be called, my young brother, Sultan bin Sirayim. He refuses to acknowledge me as a father, uh, as, his, as his son. I guess it's the goatee that makes him look a bit younger. Um, Sabs boy made, made sure that the car dealership that my uncle works on, Bin Sirayim Performance, his rallies, everything, are off limits for me. Anything related to cars, in case I get addicted and, I be, and he has another problem, because he, he worked with his brothers as his sons. And, he, and, it, and really, it took a toll on him with, with my uncle Muhammad. He's a very, very difficult person. When he was young, as he grew up, and maybe more so now. So my father did not want to experience that, so I never got to see the dealership. Whenever I did, it, I had to sneak into it. I had to go into his, uh, 
He has over 220 Cadillacs. I don't know why he collects Cadillacs for some reason. So when I got the CTS coupe and branded it with DMCC, I had it in the motor show for three days, four days. Uh, Hilal Murray was kind enough to give me a spot. It's one car, so I had it between Bugatti and Ferrari. It was right after the criticism from my father saying, not a lot of people like, uh, in the local community know about DMCC. I scratched my head, I'm like, but they're not in the commodities industry. How would they care? How would they get the message? Uh, camels? Falcons? I said, cars, cars. All locals like cars here, regardless. So I, I branded the car, put it between Ferrari and Bugatti, and had Hilal Murray put all his branding all over JLT and Al Mas Tower, wherever it's our area. And I bought the car myself and branded it. And I didn't stop there. I'm, I'm a greedy man, as you can see. I, brand, I put the car this on display in more of the Emirates between Harvey Nickel and uh, Dubenhams. A lot of exposure happened. When we put in the magazines, coincidentally, I was on the cover of those magazines. Some of them have run out, so we paid the money to print some more, and they were disappearing. The next year, or recently, and this is really nothing to do with DMCC. This was really from all the Kobe haters, and nothing to do with Kobe's visit. I had, for the life of me, I could not believe Kobe would come. The last Laker I saw was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and he looked very weird to me because everyone was a giant, and there was this Kandora that doesn't end. I didn't see his face, actually. I just saw something dark, and I guess I got a little bit. I just stopped looking because my head would flip up. In any case, uh, this is during when Muhammad Ali in his heydays was visiting Dubai. So I had, there's, there's a lot of Laker fans, but just as much as there are Laker fans, there are a lot of people who hate the Lakers, especially Kobe, because he's beaten Magic, he's beaten Jordan, and the scoring points, I told him, keep, play five, he's asked me, what should I do for my future? I told him, well, do you want an honest answer? He said, of course, I have. Well, sign five more years with the Lakers. You can't go wrong with that. No, I've played 17 years. It's sign five more years. What do I get? A few rings, you break more records. You're talking about Michael Jordan's record? I said, yeah. He said, that's six games away. So what? Keep breaking more so nobody comes close to you. I played for 17 years. I said, you joined when you were 16. So that's four years of college. That's 14 years, not, not 17 years. But in any case, uh, before that, bef hey, I had this Lebanese, why is it always Lebanese people that influence me? I don't know. <laughs> Lebanese Kobe hater who just hates Kobe because he, he just bursts his bubble all the time of reality. So 81 points in one game, less than four, four quarters, you never, nobody's going to do that, especially at a guard position. Um, kept on talking about Kobe as if Kobe is some kind of failure. How could you be a failure if you get to the final seven times and get the championship five times and you break? Anyway, I won't get into the argument. But after a lot of nagging, I got upset. And then Kobe actually said the scariest words that I would hear as a Laker fan. This summer I'll wake up and I'll, find, I'll figure out whether I'm retired or if I want to play more. I'm like, hell no. I, put an, I, I worked on an ad that to convince Kobe not to uh, retire. And I thought of different words and things like that and records, things that he cares about. Then something happened and he snapped his Achilles heels. And from his tweets, you can see that he does, he's not going out like that. He's going to play a few more years. So I thought for like a day and a half, I don't need to put that. Then I said, you know what? No athlete, not just basketball player, got a full page ad from a fan. Maybe that's one up on Jordan and the rest who they keep comparing. So I put an ad and it starts with Carpe Diem. Kobe speaks six or five, seven languages. Carpe Diem means seize the moment. And that's pretty much what DMCC does, seize the moment as well. And I do know how uptight Kobe is about priorities and uh, uh, patentees and all that. So there's no picture of Kobe. There are just the colors. Nobody has patentees on colors. And it said, I believe, if I recall correctly, here's to the Here's to Kobe, here's to the man who won't lie down, here's to the man that, won't, that will come back. At the end, Brand and Brash, you know, we had, there were like three options. I mixed and matched and put them together with what I liked. At the end, they had here's to the Black Mamba mentality, but to piss off the Kobe haters, I like to really stir it up. So here's to the greatest of all time. It was supposed to be like a letter and me signing it. Instead of signing it, I put my Twitter account. That's my signature, electronic signature, my Twitter. And then the DMCC website, the Expo 2020 branding, and DMCC branding. That's 
from me. When, when I asked the CEO of DGCX, which one was a better branding for DMCC? The hard work I went through for the car or the LA Times ad full color? He said, hands down, the LA Times. I said, but I worked really hard for the car. The LA Times, just a check and some papers and all that, that was much faster. I was running against time with the motor show and all this. And, but he said, that hit the spot because it was too random for everyone. And then coincidentally, he did come, but he's been trying to come to Dubai for two years, especially during the lockout. He actually doesn't call Dubai Dubai, he calls it Dubai. And all of the conferences he wanted to be in, press conferences, he wanted to wear a Kandora while, there, while here. That's how international Kobe Bryant is. And that's what I respect about him, the consistency, no distractions. No distractions, not even for two minutes, no distractions. He does his best.